And I don't really care. You know, if you don't like it, you don't like it. You don't have to watch it. You don't have to get it. Usually smart people do. You've been doing this a while now. Yes. A, a seasoned pro. Oh, well, um, old. <laughs> That's what we call it. Experience. Old, yes. Uh, is there anything that phases you now, particularly with a, with a live show? Um, no. I, I, I mean, I, I would hate to say no, like, no. But I mean, anything can happen. But uh, no, I mean, I think I've gotten so used to it, which is kind of a nice, I, I don't want to say used to it, like tired of it, but you know, you get into your routine of doing it. And I still treat, even though you're dealing with 2,000 people, it's, I still treat it as though it's four people, you know, because that's what I was used to in New York. Some nights you'd have four people at your show, some people you'd have 10, sometimes you'd have 100, and that was night after night. So that kind of was great training to set up for what I'm doing now, you know? But So you're even more grateful when you actually have a, a sure, full audience. Sure. Yeah. I think it's fair to say that you did all right on Drag Race. Yeah, not bad, not bad. <laughs> Modestly. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> was there any part of that, the, the show that made you vulnerable though? Because you always came across as you are now as very confident and very, very sassy and very, yeah. very smart. Was, was, were there any moments that made you feel insecure? Um, I think, well, I think the, whole, the whole thing was, was, it was a huge gamble. But I do well under pressure. I mean, that's just always been like in life, you know, with deadlines and getting things done. And then I always find a way to get it done. But with that, it was such a gamble just at that point in my life to go do the show because it could be really hit or miss. I mean, at the time I was 37 and I wanted to quit drag at 40. I was like, you know, that'd be a good run. You know, 20 years would be fine. Um, but then here's this golden opportunity to do the show. And you never know. It's not so much saying what you're doing, what I what I would tell myself, it's not to say that what you're doing is wrong, just that if you're putting yourself in this position that you are going to be critiqued and they are, people are going to give their opinions of you and it is a television show uh, and it doesn't mean you're a horrible person, you have to remember all that. And so that was what I had to keep reminding myself day after day when I would stand there and they would go, well, we don't like your hair, we don't like this. And inside of me, I wanted to go, go fuck yourself. But I would just go, <laughs> okay, okay, sure, sure. And I'm like, if you didn't give them that you know, uh, show them that vulnerability, then they wouldn't have the opportunity to get you. So Absolutely. I was just kind of like, okay, great, sure. Confession time. I did yeah. drag at the age of six. Are you kidding me? Uh, I haven't done it since, not properly. I dressed up for just some Eurovision party. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really proper. Okay, proper okay. Drag. But I actually won a talent competition. I'm nine. At six? Yes, at six. And what were you doing? Minnie Ripperton's Loving You was the track I was miming <laughs> Are you to. kidding It me? was probably awful drag. I mean, in hindsight, I've got no pictures to prove that no, I did it. But <laughs> But here's the what thing. What an odd choice. I made, I know. That's good. I made an old old man cry because he genuinely thought that I was a girl. No. So, so wait, I, in hindsight, I thought that was quite flattering. Well, that's, it's moving. Well, he was crying because he, 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 he thought you were a girl? Because I moved him. He'd obviously never heard the song. Oh, that's genius. I, I love it that he thought that you were a tiny little black woman <laughs> singing. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> that's fabulous. With probably terrible makeup too. No, that's genius. Is there anything that's happened to you that is the highest form of flattery. I made people cry. Uh, no, um, I'm supposed to say by default, oh, I, Drag Race was amazing. Uh, and it was, uh, but but I think my absolute favorite thing, and, I, and I've said it many times, was to do uh, In Bed with Joan Rivers, which was a lot of fun because I was a huge fan of Joan Rivers. So to get that opportunity was amazing. And then yeah. I killed her. No, no, no she was uh, it was also, she was very uh, generous, which she didn't, she didn't have to be, you know, especially with the schedule and the way things were going. There was four, shows being filmed that day and I was number three and probably the least known of everyone so I she didn't have to be that nice and she really was a hoot and we really did have a great time laughing and I think the interview was supposed to be like 15 minutes or so but we ended up doing like an hour of us just cackling Amazing. about everybody and talking shit about everyone yeah. which was brilliant tell us about the girls and particularly backstage because we obviously see what happens on the screen mm -hmm. we don't get to see a lot of it despite there being the spin-off shows and all the backstage stuff that happens with, with, with drag race oh, well, or, or any of the live shows when you meet up with the girls again I know you get on with it with a yes. lot of them well with the show which is genius about the show and most people don't realize uh, that we are quarantined and separated. So we're not even allowed to talk to one another unless cameras are on. So it's genius and it made a lot of sense to me because people are like, well, that's insane. I go, no, it makes sense because if I fight with you on camera and then we resolve it off camera and the next day we come back to film and everything is okay, right. the audience doesn't know what happened. And by telling an adult they can't talk makes them lose their fucking minds. Okay. So this is why everybody's kind of batshit crazy on the show because the schedule's really tight and you're not allowed to speak to one another. So, I mean, it's a true test. You know, so when they're together, it's like explosions happen because they've all this built up energy. Oh. So that's what happens backstage. We basically can't talk to one another and we're separated. We eat lunch separate and then we're all brought back on set. We're all mic'd and then the show proceeds. That control that you have must be insane. It must be well, so 
difficult. They, they, they were, the producers were good and shady too because in the morning <laughs> they would give you your mic and they would set you all in the room and they would say, "We'll be back in forty five minutes. You know, we'll start filming. We'll bring you down to set. No talking." And they would leave. And then those bitches would start and they're just yip, 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 yip. and everything that they would say would then be used against them later by the judges. I'm like, y'all are stupid. I kept I going. Love that, though. I was like, you're not gonna get me. <laughs> <laughs> not getting me but it was quite fascinating you know because it really does show I mean how people start to lose their minds yes. and you're doing it's very long days and you're doing it day after day after day after day so imagine you, we don't have that luxury of having a week and yeah. hanging out and schmoozing and that's what everybody thinks yeah. and, and I mean and I'm a, I'm a big drinker and I didn't even drink during the run of it because I was like you ain't gonna get me drunk on TV because you know what would happen <laughs> I've heard stories <laughs> oh completely so I didn't drink for that for the five and a half weeks that we filmed but when I got on the plane to fly home uh, <laughs> I had a whole bottle of wine I was like it's over you know but it was it was quite a test of yourself but then I was glad I did it like by the time you got to the end of it because we don't film the finale finale you get to a certain point and then it stops filming and then you pick back up sure. closer to it but it was uh quite the process i was like whatever happens happens but it was a lovely experience okay you're famously or rather infamously known as the queen of mean oh that's so kind <laughs> how do you cope with people that call you a bully oh i i don't because i don't first of all 99 percent of the shit people tweet or type or comment they never gonna say to my face and i don't really care you know if you don't like it you don't like it you don't have to watch it you don't have to get it usually smart people do uh, but it's not that serious i mean i'm not curing cancer here and i'm not a role model you know i'm a man who's doing what he's doing and having a good time and it's not that fucking serious but you know nowadays i mean there's a group in an organization that's always pissed off at you for something oh, i know people and you, are sensitive aren't they come, over, over ridiculous so. yeah. and then you know they'll come at you on Twitter. I don't. I don't care. So you you have this this barrier where it doesn't affect you. Does it? Does well, I think I you? think. I mean, if I go down the rabbit hole, I probably could. Right. But then I just kind of go think about what we're discussing here. There's, you know, we've got bigger problems in the world than me. Uh, but I, I think that's fascinating that everybody feels that their voice needs to be heard, or sometimes they're just saying it to to rile you up. You know, they'll comment and say something hateful just yeah. to get a reaction out of you, to get some form of attention. And you know, on occasion, after a couple of glasses of wine, I might respond. And then go, mm. <laughs> See, but, that's the thing, especially social media. Isn't oh my it? God, it you is. Have alcohol. Ooh, it's true. Away. It's true. Yeah. I mean, we've all seen the stuff people have tweeted, but it is pretty interesting how you know, like I said, it, you either get it or you don't. And I, I think that's why it doesn't affect me. If you don't get it, you don't get it. It's so fine. In that respect. When you heard Madonna's unapologetic bits, I have to say that carefully because yeah. it's really difficult to say, I can't even say it. Yeah. Did you think that song was about you? No, no, no not at all. But, uh, did you see lately the, the, the recent thing about Madonna and FedEx? That, that she's trying to get a package delivered to her, it's hysterical. And FedEx doesn't believe that she's Madonna. So she's on the phone with them going, it really is me. Like, how do you prove that you're the real Madonna? What's the worst thing that anyone had ever has ever asked you in an interview? And you can, oh, you can mention me if you like. <laughs> the ultimate um, honor, I think. Um, that's the worst thing I ever but, uh, ooh, the worst thing. Well, I mean, it's usually the same questions. They always ask you, you know, you know, what's RuPaul like? Uh, right. Or, you know, how'd you get your drag name? That kind of thing. I haven't uh, asked those yet. Yeah, it's coming up. Great. Uh, uh, RuPaul is not a real person. She's a hologram. Uh, my name was made up in a bar one night drunk. Um, sometimes I'm fascinated by, you know, people that will ask you about, you know, your, that were like, what, take me through your drag process. What is your inner child like? Yeah. I mean, like, none of that applies to me. None of that is, you know, I, I don't go there like now I'm Bianca like no I literally put on makeup I don't even blend it and I go on stage and and curse people out for an hour so it's it's not that type of thing for me so I, I don't get I don't get that serious but I, okay. I love it when people get into that they want to know more about you yeah I'm yeah. talking about getting serious don't want to take a dark turn yeah but have you ever experienced bigotry in an interview um no not really That's great. no not at all no I don't think so. I'm there are a, a lot of I'm bigots a, out there. Oh my God, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to see them, but no, there are. Truly, yeah. yeah. No, that's never really happened. Usually people are generally nice. That's good. Yeah, I can't complain. result, you're obviously doing something <laughs> right there. Well, I'm grateful they even know me. <laughs> uh, I've got a question here from Barry. He says, what's okay. the hardest thing about breaking through as an insult comic? Uh, especially when you first started as well. Um, I think, well, it wasn't a conscious choice to, to, to do it. It just happened. You know, you're in a bar and you're working and you're doing a, you know, a happy hour show at four o'clock in the afternoon for drunk people. And that's where your skills kind of came into play. You're dealing with people that aren't paying attention. You're dealing with people that really don't give a shit about who you are. And when you do that, time and time again, that's kind of where the insult comedy came from. It was just dealing with an audience or the famous kill time, you know, that you're hosting a show, a drag show in particular, so you're the one who has to kill time while a girl goes upstairs to change her clothes. So it just became the 
you know, the evolution of, of what I was to do. It wasn't a conscious choice. So breaking into it, I never really thought, well, this is what I'm doing. I just thought I was killing time. And then all of those skills kind of over, over a period of time, now it's 20, 21 years of doing it, yeah. it just kind of evolved into what I do and wow. what I'm most comfortable with. Because as a drag queen, you know, you kind of do all things. You know, sometimes you'll lip sync a song and I've done all that, and, or you danced or sang and did all that kind of stuff. And I found that none of it was as fitting as being the nasty bitch that I am. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations on the movie too. Oh, thanks. Would you do that again? Would you do it? Yeah, well, movie? we're actually filming part two this October. Amazing. We're filming part two in October. Yeah, I end up in Russia uh, at a science fair and I meet Katya and Katya becomes my, my love interest. So oh, fabulous, because yeah. we need more feel good stuff like that. Because yes. the world is a depressing place at the moment. Oh, completely. It can be a depressing place. Yeah, well, my friend Matt Kugelman, who wrote it, uh, is, is a dear friend of mine and he had this idea many years ago. So we were planning on doing it prior to Drag Race. And then once Drag Race happened, it, of course, it evolved into something bigger. And I'm just quite excited that we get to make a second one which is going to be fun in October. That is so exciting. Yes. And we're very excited about the tour. Yes. It's fabulous to see you. To Great to you see you. Today. Um, I wish you all the best with the tour and everything else. Thank you. And everything else that comes with it and see you soon. Perfect. I'll see you soon. Yeah.